My name is Justin Wyckoff. I'm the youth minister here at Grace Hills Church, and it's my great honor to preach before you today, the week after Easter. And so as I was preparing my message, I kept thinking, man, you just heard the gospel proclaimed on Easter. What can I tell them about what happens next? And I perused the four gospel accounts that are written, and I looked at all the events that transpire after, and there's one that always sticks out to me, and it's how John decides to end his gospel. Because most of the gospels end on the Great Commission itself and the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. In the proclamation, Jesus says, all authority has been invested in him, and he tells his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. John's gospel ends slightly differently. He writes this brilliant conclusion, and then he writes even more. And he tells us the end of the story for his dear friend Peter, and how Jesus talked with Peter after Peter denied Jesus three times. And I thought, man, why does John tell us that? And I realize it's digging in that he shows us how Peter came to trust and follow Jesus even after great personal failure. And as I was thinking about you who have heard the Easter message and may be committed to following Jesus for the first time or learning what it means to say that Jesus is the Lord of your life, the first thing that I was told when I became a believer and I was told again when I said I'd pursue ministry is that you're going to fail. You're going to fail a lot of times, and that's okay, because we learn to, to trust Jesus and what he did for us. The other thing about Peter is he's such a relatable character. I was able to trace Peter's life and then trace a lot of my own life through it and go, man, I, I, I recognize that. I, re- I remember that moment for me. And Peter's name sticks out among the Gospels. John MacArthur says this, Peter's name is mentioned in the Gospels more than any other name except for Jesus. No one speaks as often as Peter. No one is spoken to by the Lord as often as Peter. No disciple is so frequently rebuked by the Lord as Peter. But no one else confessed Christ more boldly or acknowledged his lordship more explicitly. Yet... No other disciple ever verbally denied Christ as forcefully or as publicly as Peter did. But before we learn about Peter, we need to look at a man named Simon. Before we do that, I'm going to pray for us. Dear Lord, I know that no matter what outline I have before me, no matter what slides are on the screen, this proclamation of who you are is foolish if you're not behind it. Lord, I pray that you would be behind my words, that your love would be in my heart, and Lord, I pray that you would be on the ears of the listeners, that you would remove any distractions, and that they could hear what you have for them today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before Simon, before Peter, there was a man named Simon. And when Jesus first meets Simon, he names him Peter. And this man, Simon, was a fisherman. That was the main thing that we know about him. And I used to think about that. That's just a, fishing is just, everyone fishes. That's just a hobby, right? Fishing was a serious business back in the day. Oh boy, as I learned about it. They were smart, those fishermen. They had to work with multiple boats and had this huge net. They would be out at night fishing because the nets were so thick that the fish could literally see it during the day, so they had to fish at night. Then in the morning, you'd have to pull these huge nets out. You'd have to clean them, mend them where they tore, and you'd be working a lot. You had to be a hard worker. Not only that, These guys were doing stuff that our business guys do today. They were avoiding taxes by living in different districts where they can avoid the sales tax of their fish. I mean, they were savvy businessmen, these fishermen, and it was competitive. Josephus, a first century historian, tells us there was about 230 other boats at the Sea of Galilee fishing. If you weren't out catching them, someone else was. 
And that's who Peter was. I mean, that's who Simon was. I'm going to use those names interchangeably the whole time, just so you know. But that's who Simon was. He was a fisherman. He provided for his family. And he had a good business. And it was a business that was booming at the time. But then his older brother, Andrew, decides to introduce him to this guy named Jesus. And this is that first encounter that he has with him. It's recorded in John He, being Andrew, his older brother, brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Cephas is the Aramaic name. Both names, Peter and Cephas, mean the the word rock. It's talking about a rock is what it means. As soon as he meets him, he goes, I know who you are. I know who your dad is. And I know who you will be. Jesus knew Simon. The difference was, Simon didn't yet know Jesus. And that's what Jesus invited Simon to next. He invited him to get to know him. And this is called discipleship. In Mark 1, 16 through 18, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. These are not the type of guys that you would think that would go for something like this. They had invested so much into those nets and so much into their livelihood But at the word of Jesus, they left it all behind and followed him. And that's the same invitation that he asks of us today. He knows everything about you. And he's inviting you now to set everything aside and to learn who he is. And what he invites them in is not that it's like, hey, like it is today in learning, go buy my course pack and then sit in on my classes and lectures and then you'll know, you know, what I teach. No, Jesus had them learn who he was by living with him. This was like a three-year camping trip they were about to go on. And they were going to eat, sleep, pray with, be with Jesus the whole time. They would learn not only from what Jesus said, but what Jesus did. That's what Simon got to experience. And over time, Simon realizes who this guy Jesus really is. And that's recorded in Matthew. Matthew 16, 13 through 18. And when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, um, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. In summary, he asked his disciples who know him best, who do they say he is? And they had come to the realization after seeing all these teachings and miracles and his proclamations that this Jesus truly is the Son of God. He is the Christ, the King, the long-awaited one. They realize, this is where Simon realizes who Jesus is. He starts to know Jesus. He starts to know Jesus' other name, which is Lord of Lords, that he's the Messiah. And this is where Jesus makes a shift in the name. He doesn't say, you shall be Peter. He says, you are Peter. But let's not miss something here. There's a lot of complexity to this verse, and we're not going to get to all of it. Hopefully, you guys discuss it more in life groups. Notice that the rock that the church is built on is not Peter. Those names sound the same in the text. It's what Peter proclaimed about Jesus, that Jesus was who he said he was. 
That is the rock the church is built on. And Peter's proclamation of who Jesus is is going to be the catalyst that grows the church. And we're going to get to see that. But there is a lot that Simon is going to have to learn. A summary of some of the encounters that Simon has with Jesus throughout his travelings with him would be that he's one of the biggest loudmouths in Jesus' company. Simon is always the first to be very vocal about conviction that Jesus was the Christ. He knew for sure who Jesus was, and he had all the church answers to Jesus' questions, but his answers would always reveal he had zero understanding what Jesus came to do. He knew who Jesus was. He didn't understand what Jesus was going to do. John MacArthur, I don't know why I keep quoting him, but he says that Peter was the disciple with a foot-shaped mouth. (laughs) Because he always had to put his foot in his mouth. Because he would always be quick and impulsive to speak. But he didn't have the understanding. A really good example of this is the moment that Jesus goes to wash his disciples' feet showing them that he's come, even though he's Lord of Lords, he is coming in this moment to serve them, not to be served. And they have no understanding of this. And Jesus even says that. Let's look at John 13, 6, 9. He comes over to Simon Peter to wash his feet. It said, and Peter says to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you shall have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Foot-shaped mouth. In his impulsivity, he said the very thing He rejected the gift that Jesus was giving. He had no idea the meaning. He had no understanding that Jesus was showing him that he was there to wash him clean of his sins. And then he wavers immediately. He thought he gave the right answer. No, 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 you're Lord. You're not going to do this. He's like, actually, I am, or else you can't be a part of me. Oh, well, then never mind to do it. This is the character of Peter. I'm just, as a side note, I wonder if the other disciples were a little annoyed at this guy. (laughs) I wonder if he was a little obnoxious. I just wonder that. It's clear that Peter doesn't know the good news yet. His purpose is that he's going to be the proclaimer of who Jesus is. But Jesus strictly tells him, don't tell anyone I'm the Christ yet. And I wonder if part of the reason is because While they might know who he is, they don't know what he's here to do. And so they're not ready to proclaim him as Christ. Peter doesn't know that Jesus is coming to serve, not to be served. And so Peter's view of leadership, of being this core figure in the church, is that he's going to go and follow Jesus into a throne room and get to rule with him and be part of this authority and this great figure. And he doesn't know that it's actually going to involve following Jesus to his grave. This is another blunder by Peter at the Last Supper. Time's counting down now. Jesus is about to go and get crucified. And they still don't understand it. Matthew 26, 31 through 35 Jesus is explaining it to him. Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. So he tells them what's going to happen that night. He goes, I'm going to get struck. You all are going to scatter. But later we'll meet up in Galilee. Peter couldn't accept that. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, 
you will deny me three times. Imagine the God of the universe saying that to you, that in that very night you're going to do something that you really don't want to do, that you have said and proclaimed, you will never do this. You are so committed to him. Look at Peter's response here. This is the moment where he could have said, Lord, I am going to do that. I, I had no idea. I'm so sorry. But Lord, I trust that you know that about me. But, but that's not what he says. He doubles down. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Peter is leading the disciples the way he's supposed to, but he's leading them to follow him in his own impulsivity, his own, self his own self reliance, his own self will, that out of his own strength he will overcome his destiny, that he will stay committed and stay pure before Jesus out of his own will. That strong independence that probably made him such a good businessman was now here prevalent, but he's, miss, he's missing it. There's a second conversation very similar to this one. But this one happens, we have to understand what happens in the conversation before. Basically, the disciples start talking to themselves and go, hey, who do you guys think is the greatest among us? Out of Jesus' followers, who among us really follows him the best? Who's going to sit on the throne closest to Jesus? Who's going to have the most authority alongside him? When we go into Jerusalem, we overthrow Roman occupation, and we establish the new kingdom under God, who do you think is going to be closest to Jesus? Who's the greatest? Such a dumb question. And Jesus corrects them with this. And we know that Simon's the one in this conversation the most, because Jesus' response is, Simon, Simon, Luke 22, 31 through 34, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death, and Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. He uses Simon's old name, that foolish old Simon. He just doesn't get it. And he speaks this idea that Satan wishes to sift them like wheat. The idea of sifting wheat the way we do it today, so we have a big sieve, and we put the wheat inside, and then we shake it. And through the sieve comes all the chaff, all of the light, loose particles that were protecting the grain. And what we have left is the grain. The way they used to do it back then is they had a basket like this, really shallow, and they put the wheat in it, and they would shake it. And then as the lighter, looser parts of the grain came up, they would then move the basket, catch all the heavy stuff, and let the rest fall to the ground. That was how they purified wheat. It says, the enemy wants to shake up your life tonight, Peter. And Jesus doesn't say that he's, not, that he's gonna stop the enemy from doing that. And that very night, Peter's life is gonna go through a tailspin The enemy is going to sift him like wheat. The Lord that he loves so much, that he has sworn to follow, that he hopes to reign over a kingdom with, will soon be arrested, accused of crimes he didn't commit, beaten bloody, and hung on a Roman cross. Simon's whole worldview is about to shake this new identity of being a leader, of being Peter, is about to enter a tailspin as he comes face to face with what the calling truly means for him. That he's being called not to follow Jesus to a throne room, but to follow Jesus to a grave, to a cross. 
and he wasn't ready, and he was too afraid. While Jesus was being dragged in an unjust court trial, Peter hides outside by a campfire, and twice people walk up to him and go, hey, I think I recognize you. Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? And Peter denies it. And the third time says this, and after an interval of about an hour, still another persisted, saying, certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And this is my favorite one because it says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I'm just trying to imagine the look that Jesus gave him. I don't think it's a look of condemnation. I don't think it's a look of anger. I think it's a look of, I know, Peter. I know. The fact that Jesus would meet his eyes at that very moment, that he would know the very moment that the rooster would crow, the very thing that Peter would say. Jesus knew he would deny him. So why did he let it happen? Well, you have to go back to the idea of that sifting of the wheat. The reason we sift wheat is because we want the chaff to blow away. We want to separate what's loose from the grain, from what's valuable. And so when he sifted Peter, what he did is he shook up his life, but he prayed that there would still be faith remaining in the basket, that there would be enough. And all of Peter's words of commitment would be as empty as the chaff blowing in the wind. And what Peter would see is left is just his faith, just knowing who Jesus was. Now we get to the end of John's gospel. What will Jesus do with this disciple who denied him three times? Well, first of all, he told them that he would meet them in Galilee, as we talked about earlier. So that's where they go, and they wait for Jesus. And while they're waiting, Simon has this brilliant idea. Hey, guys, let's go fishing. And I don't know if that's a return to his old life and his old ways in the absence of Jesus, or if they were just really hungry, or honestly, maybe it's the best therapy you could give a guy like that through what he's been through to just take a moment out on the ocean and think and do something familiar and process what happened. But either way, there's this, as they're fishing, there's this guy on the shore that yells out to him. He goes, hey, did you guys catch anything? No, we fished all night. There was nothing. Hey, try casting your net on the other side. Which, by the way, for fishing, that should make zero difference. Fishing in the morning is like the worst time for them to fish. <laughs> and they're like, okay. And this has happened to them before with Jesus. So they cast it, and they pull up a bunch of fish. So much, they keep talking about how they're surprised the net doesn't break. And John's the first to realize, oh my gosh, that guy on the shore is Jesus. And Peter goes, it's Jesus. He tears, puts his clothes on, he jumps in the water. And he goes swimming. And they finally meet Jesus to the shore, and Jesus is sitting there at a campfire. And he has fish and bread ready for them. He goes, come, come eat and eat breakfast with Jesus. That's this, just the setting of the scene, the moment that we're in. John 21, 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And the question is, what are the these? Is Jesus referring to the fish that they're cooking? emblematic, symbolic of Simon's old life, his old identity? Did he want that more than what, he, what Jesus was offering him? Or, and I would say maybe even and, was he pointing at the other disciples sitting around them? Because remember, Peter once said, though they will all fall away, I never will, Jesus. I'm more committed. 
We're not sure. I think it was maybe the disciples. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. There's a lot of repetition that's about to happen in this verse. Um, and I've studied this, these verses a lot, and I've read a lot of commentaries on them. And it's, it's very interesting because the word that Jesus uses for love either has a lot of meaning in this text or it means absolutely nothing because John does write them interchangeably. But what we see happen here is that Jesus is going to use the word for love in the Greek. It's going to be a word about commitment. And Peter's going to respond with the word for love that's talking about brotherly friendship. And tell the last one. So he said to him a second sign, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Simon, son of John, this is the third time, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. It could be that Jesus is asking Peter, are you sure you're really committed to me? How do you know, Peter? Are you committed? Lord, I know that I'm, I love you as a friend. I love you with my feelings. But are you, are you more committed to them? Are you committed, Peter? I love you with my feelings. Do you even love me that way? You sure you even love me as a friend? Lord, you know everything. This is his response. I always wrestled with, why is Jesus approaching it this way? And we have to remember, there was two other appearances of Jesus with the disciples before this. So it could be that Peter's already had that conversation with Jesus and been forgiven. I'm not sure. But I know that Jesus isn't asking these questions in order to make up for the three denials. I don't think that's what's happening. I think there's three in order to cue to Peter that is related to the denials. And I don't think that Jesus doesn't know what the answers to these questions are. I think he's asking them because he wants to see, he wants Peter to ask himself those questions. Here's one thing I know about Simon, Simon Peter, is the old Simon, before the trial, before he denied Jesus, if Jesus were to ask him this question over and over, by the third time he would have started swearing that he loves Jesus. Jesus, why are you asking me three times? I love you so much, I love you more than all of them, I love you more than my family, more than my mother, on my mother's grave I love you. That's how, that's how Peter is. He was just so, so vocal about his commitment. There's one more thing that repeats here. Yes, there's the feeding of the sheep, and then it's lambs, and then sheep again. That's odd. All of that accumulates in. He's calling him to focus on service. Now that Peter knows what it means to be a leader, to serve, not to be served, he's calling him to focus on that. But the other thing that repeats is that he says, you know. Lord, you know. Lord, and at the third one, when he's about to break, he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. I think Jesus has the right answer. Whereas the old Peter would have started swearing his fealty to Jesus, this is the answer that Peter needed to learn. This is the answer that Peter should have given when Jesus told him he would deny him. Instead of doubling down and saying, no, I never will, Jesus, he should have said, Jesus, Lord, you know everything. Wow. You know that? Lord, is that true? You should have known if Jesus tells you you're going to do something in the future, that's, 
the Son of God telling you what's going to happen in the future. And I love that Jesus then explains a little bit more about what he knows about Simon Peter. He says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. What an odd statement. Jesus saying, yeah, I do know you, Peter. I knew you before I met you when you were fishing at Simon. He's showing him a perspective of, I knew you when you were a young boy. You'd get up in the morning, you'd dress yourself for your day, and you would go do all the childhood things that you wanted to do. I saw you then. I loved you then. I do know everything. I know everything about you, Simon. Because Jesus is Lord. He's, he's the Father God. He's the one that was there knitting Simon in his mother's womb with purpose and intention. And he goes, here's that foot-shaped mouth I'm going to use. Jesus sees him and knows him. And then he continues, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. John hints to us what this means. This he said to show about what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this to him, he said, follow me. The very phrase that led Simon the fisherman all the way to this point that made him drop his nets is the same phrase that Jesus says again. Now that Simon Peter knows what it truly means to follow Jesus, that you're not following him to be a ruler, you're following him to be sacrificed, to give up everything, he says, follow me. And I used to think, wow, what a dark, bleak thing for Jesus to say to him, telling him, one day you are going to die for me. But you know what? That was the one thing that Simon failed to do. That night when Jesus was betrayed, if Simon was a good follower, he would have taken up his cross. He would have followed Jesus. He would have been executed alongside of him. If he was truly committed to his Lord, that's what he would have done. And he failed. And I bet it's his biggest regret that he didn't follow. His <laughs> and so when Jesus tells him, I told you one day you would fail. Now I tell you one day you'll succeed. One day you will. You will let your hands get stretched out. You will die for me. And that's the end of John's gospel. There's a quick word where Peter immediately hears this and he goes, well, what's going to happen to John? What's John's destiny? And Jesus is quick to rebuke him and say, don't worry about John, you follow me. Just something we all need to hear sometimes. We worry a lot about other people. So what happens to Peter? I'm going to give you a summary of 11 chapters of the book of Acts. Ten days after Jesus ascended back into heaven came the day of the, the Holy Spirit was poured into the hearts of all believers at the day of Pentecost. Jesus promised that when he ascends, he's going to come back down. And he's going to help them to stay committed to him. The witnesses to this event had no idea what was happening. It was so confusing. There was nothing like it ever before. People were speaking different languages. It was crazy, a crazy day. And in the very city that Jesus, eight weeks earlier, had been beaten and crucified in, Peter stands up alongside the 11 other disciples, and he finally proclaims who Jesus is and what he came to do. And 3,000 people get saved. 
And that is the catalyst. Peter's proclamation of Jesus is the catalyst which grew the church. He was one of the greatest preachers out of the 12 disciples. I'm just going to read the last part of his sermon. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. And 3,000 people, 3,000 souls got saved that day. Peter continued to be led by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news to the nations. And Christian tradition tells us that around 30 years later, Peter was imprisoned. He was about to be executed. His wife was executed first. He was bound. He was being led the place where he didn't want to go. And he asked the guards this. He asked them to crucify him upside down because he thought it was too glorious to die the same way as Christ did. He felt unworthy of it. Peter's mind and heart rested on his friend and savior Jesus until his dying breath That's the power of the Holy Spirit within us to help us succeed where we'd otherwise fail. So many conclusions to make off the story of Simon Peter. I will will conclude with this. There is a connection between the things we know and the things we love. The things you love are the things you tend to know the most about. And the reason you tend to know the most about those things is because you love those things. Jesus knows everything about you. He knows who you think you are. He knows your family. He knows your childhood. He knows your fears. He knows your heart. He knows who he made you to become. He knows your past failures. He knows your future denials. He knows every decision you can make. He knows every decision you will make. He knows how you will die. And he loves you very much. And he invites you to know him. Your purpose might not be the likes of Peter. We live in a society that says we can't have true success unless we're truly number one. That's a lie. That's a lie Jesus needed to break in Peter. Because Jesus was number one. He was first. And he made himself last. The one that should be served came to serve us all. But your purpose, like Peter's, is to serve others to the glory of God in the way that God made you to. And while failure is certain with Jesus, failure is never final. Because even in the face of great personal failure, to stay committed to Jesus, we can trust that Jesus still loves us and invites us to continue to follow him. Just like he said to Peter that day on the beach. He says, Peter, I know you. Follow me. Will you follow Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. I pray we would trust you, Lord that we would receive the invite to know you deeply so you can change us all from Simon's to Peter's for your glory. I pray we wouldn't be a church focused on when we fail, but instead we focus on where to follow you next. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen.